And in the House, we have Speaker Pelosi holding on to the gavel, but also under fire from some Democrats for the party's losses. And the tensions, they erupted on a party conference call on Thursday as moderates warned about drifting left. One of them sounding a warning was Representative Abigail Spamberger, a Democrat from the Richmond, Virginia area. I actually moderated her debate last month, and she now narrowly leads in her reelection bid. Here is what she said. Strong message from Representative Spamberger, Sue. What is it? What is it like inside of the House Democratic Caucus tonight? Well, this has been sort of the central tension for Democrats for the past two years. It was the tension we saw play out in the Democratic presidential primary, too, is these sort of forces between the moderate wing and the more liberal progressive wing. It's complicated because a lot of the energy inside the caucus is coming from the more progressive wing. I think best exemplified by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the more younger female dynamic members. You also saw in the same election cycle, um, veteran Democratic incumbents losing to younger, uh, more progressive candidates and a lot of progressives were going into this election thinking they had the energy they were going to define the agenda and that is not really what I think most of the party sees as the outcome of 2020 and you have a lot of moderates who feel like the party left them hanging in this election that when the conversation shifted to things like defund the police or when the continual attacks that Joe Biden was a socialist and they were going to move the party to the left that they never gave a sort of cohesive pushback to those arguments, that they didn't have a counter, and that left them vulnerable. The, the truth about a lot of it is that a lot of these House districts that they lost were districts they probably never would have had a good shot in to begin with, ex if not for that Democratic wave in 2018. You know, sort of some districts set back to the norm, especially in a national election. So there wasn't necessarily huge surprising losses for Democrats. I think a lot of Democrats see this as districts that they were lucky to ever have in the first place. And I think Nancy Pelosi is a pragmatist. She's not someone who's going to agonize over these results. I think that she, mm -hmm. similar to Mitch McConnell, they see that the majority is the only thing that matters, and she still has the majority, and she still has the speaker's gavel. And we don't anticipate any challenge to her leadership. Yamish, how will Senator Bernie Sanders, someone you've closely covered, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, handle this? Peter said they shouldn't expect a Green New Deal or sweeping legislation on some of their initiatives because of the gridlock. So how do they move forward? They move forward by trying to push a, a possible President Biden to the left. I've been talking to activists who say that they were happy to back Joe Biden when he was, of course, running against someone that they saw as a common enemy and President Trump. But the moment that he gets into office, people are ready to essentially pick it outside the White House Democrats in order to get their way. Um, one of the things that, that I think is a big divide is also this idea of defunding the police, socialism, uh, the Green New Deal. There are so many different things that are at the heart of the American uh, life in this country um, that that have real big um, implications for the future of this country. And I think there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of jostling for power there. Of course, Nancy Pelosi is running for Speaker of the House, but uh, let's remember that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she's popular. She is someone who's charismatic. Um, she has the ear of a lot of people, a lot of the, the Democratic base really like her style. Um, so I think that you're going to see a lot of Democrats really wanting to make sure that the Biden administration goes farther than the than Joe Biden has gone in the past. And maybe that means they'll try to install Senator Bernie Sanders as Labor Secretary or Senator Warren as Treasury Secretary. Peter, I saw you nodding your head. Jump in. Yeah, I don't think that's happening. I, I, I can't see a Mitch McConnell led Senate confirming Bernie Sanders to the cabinet or Elizabeth Warren. In fact, the, the one thing about uh, uh, the, the, the Republicans maybe possibly holding on to the Senate that might be good for Bur uh, Biden is that it kind of gives him an excuse if he doesn't want to do things uh, that the liberals would like him to do. He can say, look, you know, I can't get this done. There's a good, you know, the look over there, what I got to deal with. I think, I think that Biden's cabinet choices, though, are significantly altered as a result of this election at this point. I mean, I, you know, is he going to get Susan Rice in as Secretary of State, or does he have to go with somebody who is more acceptable to Republicans, like, uh, say, Chris Coons, from the senator from Delaware? Uh, I think Yamish is exactly right that the, the coalition that backed Biden up until this point 
is a fragile one. And it was united not out of excitement over Joe Biden or out of any particular ideology or, ideology or philosophical agreement, but out of the mutual antipathy for Donald Trump. And if and when Donald Trump leaves the scene, that, that coalition no longer has the same impetus to stay together. And I think it's a huge challenge for Vice President and possibly President-elect Biden going forward, how to keep them together, keep them behind him, keep them excited uh, and backing whatever agenda he does try to move forward with. Jake, you heard Sue. She said she doesn't expect a challenge to Speaker Pelosi. You cover House leadership. What's your take? What's your latest reporting? Is there going to be a challenge? And if not a challenge to Speaker Pelosi, will there be some kind of shakeup in the committee chairs, in the leadership structure? You would think so, but I don't, I don't anticipate any. I mean, it seems like the Democrats are just going to rubber stamp their leadership once again. Nancy Pelosi has, is at no risk of being taken out, and Sue knows this well. I mean, she is the strongest speaker we've had in, in probably a decade or more. I mean, she she's, has incredible internal support. She has, there's no one who even wants to take her on. If, there's nobody who could even get anywhere close to the votes it would need to knock her off. So she's there until she wants to leave. And Sue is right. She cares about the majority, and that's all she cares about. But I will say, I mean, this episode with Spanberger, who you did uh, moderate that debate with, Bob, I mean, it, it is illustrative of the larger dynamic in the Democratic caucus, mm. the push and pull between the majority makers, the people who were the conservatives and the moderates from districts like Richmond and, and Oklahoma, where they lost a seat, and, and the more liberal wing of the party. The Democratic caucus has moved to the left. There's no question about that. And whether it's governable right now will be a uh, really something to behold in the next six to eight months. And and this is not the, Demo the Democratic Party of 2006 and 2008 when they won their majority and brought in people from Ohio and the upper Midwest mm -hmm. and the Southeast and the Southwest. This is a different kind of Democratic Party, a leftward drif drifting Democratic Party, which Pelosi is going to have to do her best to wrangle over the next year or so. Jake, a, a quick follow up. I spoke Bob, to can I say a couple of things? Yeah, please jump in, Sue. Just a couple points about Pelosi that I think are worth thinking about. I talked to a lot of Democratic lawmakers who say this, too, that if Biden wins this election, he's going to want Nancy Pelosi to stay as speaker. So I think that that has a Absolutely. very calming effect on the Democratic caucus, that they're not going to want to go against Joe Biden if he wins. The other thing to remember is two years ago, Nancy Pelosi cut a deal with Democrats to say that she would only serve two more terms. So if she keeps her word, this would be Nancy Pelosi's last term as speaker, and she would effectively be a lame duck speaker from the start. Peter, what about uh, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy? He's been so close to President Trump. If President Trump's off the scene, does he become the leader of a, a Tea Party-style revival in the House against a Democratic president? I spoke to Senator Richard Blumenthal this week, and he said, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And he said you could, the Democrats could see a, a revived Republican House minority try to roar back to power. Yeah, I mean, for the last couple of years in particular, as if they've been in the minority under a Speaker Pelosi, they've had to defer to President Trump. They've had to be basically his backstop, uh, and they haven't had uh, an opportunity to really flex their muscles in a, in a different way other than defending him, say, during impeachment. Now they have an opportunity to try to set the agenda, their own agenda anyway, as they as they move forward in an opposition role. And I think that some of them may relish that, 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 that they will enjoy uh, being in the opposition to a president rather than having to uh, explain the latest thing that President Trump has said or defend the latest thing that President Trump has done. Uh, now, Kevin McCarthy's an interesting character, right? I mean, like, he, uh, he was a skeptic of President Trump from the beginning. Remember, he was quoted as saying that he thought that President Trump might even be on Vladimir Putin's payroll. Then he became one of uh, Trump's, you know, biggest, most uh, uh, stalwart defenders even up to this last few days. Uh, whether mm -hmm. that, you know, how he pivots in a, in a, in a Trump-free Washington is a really interesting question.